Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well today. It's a Thursday night, but I just had to film this because I just read the most amazing novel called The Painted Veil by William Somerset Maugham. And yes, that's how you say his name. Um, so this is going to be a bit of a different video, but I wanted to just go over it in some great detail, actually. And I'm going to start with what the book's about, talk about the characters and the themes, and a few of the major plot points, but I'm going to pause the video a little ways in and uh, let you turn it off if you do not want to know the ending, because I decided that I needed to talk about the whole book, including the ending. It's just that amazing. It is one of the very best novels I've ever read, honestly. Yeah, I don't want to hype it up too much, but I just was deeply impressed with The Painted Veil. I do want to get the elephant out of the room before I start and say that this is a very dated novel. Um, it's from the 1920s, I believe, and so you'll find a lot of racial slurs and derogatory language uh, regarding the people of China where this book takes place. So bear that in mind. Um, very typical of a book from that era, and indeed pretty offensive. Um, just wanted to let you know before you go into it. So, where to start? So, early on in the book, I just had this thought, and I'll just read it. Humans want to be flattered, our pride appeased, because it gives us a sense of power, also mutual flattery. But when you love someone, you don't flatter them. You, in fact, hold them to a higher standard and help them be become accountable to more than their mere pride. I mentioned this novel was written in the 1920s. It reminded me of a couple other books from around the same era, and those two novels are The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald and The House of Mirth by Edith Wharton. The Painted Veil just to keep us focused here. Um, the Painted Veil reminded me a lot of both of those books, but it is very different. I would say it is the antithesis to The Great Gatsby and its character, uh, its main character of Kitty Fane is the antithesis to Lily Bart from The House of Mirth. Just to kind of put it in context, how this novel affected me and how very impressed I was with it. Um, so I mentioned that it takes place in China. More specifically, it starts out um, with this young lady, Kitty, and she marries this young man named Walter Fane, who is a bacteriologist um, in China. So first they go to Hong Kong to live and it talks about life in Hong Kong, and if you've watched the movie The Empire of the Sun, you kind of get an idea of what that was like. Um, very similar. Um, you had this, uh, the colonials living in their own area, and then everybody else was, you know, the general populace was outside the walls of that colonial district, so to speak. Anyway, um, <laughs> the problem is that this lady, Kitty Fane, does not love her husband, Walter. And why does she not love him? So, the thing that's really important about the story and what you have to keep in mind is Kitty's background. Um, she comes from a family where... The father is not particularly successful. Um, he never brings in as much money as his wife wishes him to. Um, his wife being Kitty's mother, of course. And Kitty's mother is very demanding of the father. And she's really just interested in her family. Um, sorry, this seems to be getting out of focus. She's really just interested in her family... Um, making a name for themselves in the world. So since her husband has not, she's counting on the fact that Kitty will marry well. Kitty and her sister. 
Um, so this reminded me very much, like I said, of the House of Mirth. And especially that dynamic of the overbearing mother and the, I guess you could say the weak father. Kitty ends up marrying this young man, Walter, whom she doesn't really love, but she's kind of running out of time. At least in those days, it was considered to be running out of time as you reached your mid-twenties and were not married. He, on the other hand, is very much in love with her, and so it pains him a lot, as you can imagine, that she doesn't return his feelings. So yeah, uh, they go to Hong Kong. This is where things start to go really wrong. Uh, although you could say they were probably doomed from the start, seeing as how Kitty doesn't love Walter, but in Hong Kong she meets Charlie Townsend, and Charlie is a middle-aged guy who is very charismatic. He is already married, but he and Kitty start an adulterous relationship, and um, eventually Walter finds out. So when he finds out, they Kitty wants to get a divorce, but uh, Charlie will not marry her for obvious reasons. He doesn't want to divorce his wife. He basically just uses his wife and he has children as well, so he has no interest in uh, getting embroiled in scandals, public scandals. And he sends her away, so she doesn't get a divorce. In fact, she and Walter are embarking on a journey to go to this town. And I'm trying to remember the name of the town. I can't think of it off the top of my head. Um, but they go to this town, and the town is stricken with cholera. Walter is pretty much the only medical man in the vicinity, at least that's my understanding. Um, so he goes there to try to help them, and he insists that Kitty comes with him. And she doesn't really have anywhere else to go. Um, at this point, she does not want to go back to her mother, because her mother just doesn't want her around. And um, she's she feels a bit angry, a little bit ashamed, mostly angry, uh, with Charlie because she expected him to forsake all and um, pursue her completely, but that is not the case. So it's with these very mixed and bitter feelings that she follows Walter to this uh, town where, where there's cholera. And uh, as you can imagine, it's pretty scary for her as well. So that's kind of how the, the book starts out. I feel like I'm starting to ramble a little bit. Um, but a lot of drama, a lot of heartbreak, um, especially for Walter. Walter is a very decent young man, and that is um, something that comes, I think, as a bit of a surprise to Kitty. She kind of resents it because he is so decent and she is, you know, cheating on him almost shamelessly. Um, so it is very awkward and painful when they get to this village. Um, and for the most part, she really doesn't see him all that much because he's busy uh, working and she doesn't really have anything to do here. Um, until she meets the nuns. So there is a convent here and there are a few sisters who are trying to keep things together at this convent and it's basically an orphanage as well. They have many, many children there, especially abandoned daughters whom their families did not want. And they're also trying to take care of those who have this terrible disease because we're talking about an epidemic. And um, not only are the children dying, but the nuns are dying as well. So it's quite a very tragic situation. When Kitty finally goes to visit the convent, she is completely taken aback by the the poverty, 
that these nuns are living in and um not not just that but the the peace that they seem to have with within them in spite of the suffering in spite of the hard work and all of the children that are clamoring around them uh these nuns are nevertheless at peace and she she senses that they have this thing that she she does not have so there's Sister St. Joseph, and then there's the Mother Superior. I don't remember what her name was. I'm not even sure it's mentioned. I tried to find it just now and couldn't find it. But anyway, um, something that that kind of brings up too is there's a lot of contrast in this book between families. And um, in the Mother Superior, Kitty finds a very strong woman. Um, she's very principled and... It's completely different than the mother, her own biological mother back in England. Um, and it, you know, it makes Kitty feel inspired, a little ashamed, and and just odd, frankly. She, she's always awed by the mother superior. And then she becomes friends with Sister St. Joseph as well. Another person they meet here is a um, officer? Was he an officer? Uh, Waddington. We'll just call him Waddington. Um, he's a character. He's a, a Britisher who's really one of the few other Europeans in this town. And he becomes a friend of Kitty. Um, he's kind of a comical character. He's a bit uh, cynical. So there's kind of a bit of comic relief there. But actually he's a pretty serious character in his own way. He's not very uh, friendly to Catholicism, but he does respect, I think, the nuns and helps them out when they need help. Um, so there's an interesting dynamic there that I think is pretty realistic. Okay, so that's the basic um, setup of the plot. I want to dig a little deeper into the relationship between Kitty and Walter. Um, why does she dislike him so much, and why did he marry her to begin with? So, oops. Um, Walter is a very bookish young man and completely opposite of Charlie Townsend. Um, Charlie is old, he's a womanizer, he is athletic, and just a general popular guy. Walter is unpopular, very nerdy, um, nervous, I would say introverted and not confident in social settings. So when he meets Kitty, I mean, she's a very beautiful young lady, and he also believes he can't really do any better than her. Um, and he really loves her for kind of mysterious reasons. Um, and Kitty doesn't find him charismatic or attractive at all. It was just a marriage of convenience from her perspective. Um, but but the thing about it is when they get to this town with the cholera, she starts to hear things about him from other people. So Mr. Waddington um, tells her what a jerk Charlie is and what a decent person Walter is, even though Mr. Waddington, again, doesn't really like anybody, but he realizes that Walter is a person of character and decency and has really done all he can to help these sick Chinese citizens, and the nuns love Walter as well, because he shows true care and concern for their orphans, and again, for the general people who are suffering in such a hideous way. And uh, that's another thing that's kind of interesting about how this is written, is everything is told very much from Kitty's perspective, so in order to meet these other characters, it really is presented in this organic way where she's talking to to Charlie directly and then she goes and talks to Mr. Waddington a great deal who sheds light on the other characters which she has to at first reluctantly but eventually um eventually she comes to understand what he's talking about and she realizes she's been used by Charlie and that Walter has always loved her from a place of respect and, well, until, you know, the uh, affair was found out. 
And the same goes for the sisters. So, again, everything's from her perspective, which makes it a little heavy at times. But you feel like you're very much enveloped in the story. And another thing I really loved about this book is it's written a lot like This Side of Paradise by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Um, he uses very short chapters. There's actually 80 chapters, but they're very, very short. Some of them are a page or less than a page. And so it's told in a series of vignettes, which I really enjoyed. And um, it gives you kind of a... I mean, I was thinking about this from a writing perspective. And I feel like the short chapters really are very reflective of real life. When you go about your life, you don't... You're not writing a book continuously, at least. I mean, hopefully not. Um, you know, when you're looking at it in your mind's eye, it's it's a series of vignettes. It's a series of scenes. It's not a continuous narrative. There was one scene in particular that was so moving to me, and it's when um, they're at dinner and in their bungalow, uh, which used to be a missionary's until the missionary died, and then they came in and ended up taking the bungalow to live in. Um, they're eating dinner, and the Chinese cook brings in salad for them to eat, and uh, Kitty just is eating the salad, and and she's very bitter at this point against Walter for bringing her here, and bitter at everything that's happened, and she's really missing Charlie. And... And, you know, he tells her, you shouldn't be eating that salad because it's not, you know, it's not safe. And she's just eating it in this rebellious manner, um, suicidally, you might say. Um, but what's so interesting is Walter, he, he eats the salad too. It, it's kind of a weird scene, but it, it really speaks to this, this gap between them that he's trying to always span and she's always holding back because she can never seem to get out of these things that her mother and her background and and just herself really have instilled in her since since youth and so it's so hard for her to accept someone else's view and someone else seeing her in a different light too so things are pretty bad in this town, as I've already mentioned. It even mentions here that uh, people were dying at the rate of a hundred a day. And again, Walter's there every day, working tirelessly. And what what really struck me was the fact that, you know, he's terribly hurt by what Kitty did to him. And what he's done is he's transferred his love to these people here. He no longer has any feelings for her. That's made pretty clear. Um, so he has poured himself into this mission of his, and there's, you know, he still treats her with respect and care, but he, there's just nothing left. And when she starts to see that, when she starts to see his qualities and also starts to see that he doesn't love her anymore, there's an immense depression that comes over her, as you can imagine. Um... A few other things that I just want to touch on before I kind of get towards the end of the book and the bigger picture that I was taking from this story. Um, oh, let me see if I can find the right quotes here. There's this whole problem of um, Kitty's adultery and... Just the way that she perceives what happened and how she's not really taking responsibility for what she did. And this quote here really sums it up. She considers it as regrettable and shocking even, but to be forgotten rather than to be repented of. It was like making a blunder at a party. There was nothing to do about it. It was dreadfully mortifying, but it showed a lack of sense to ascribe too much importance to it. And this kind of comes back a few times, this idea that it's just another thing that happens in life. And something that she feels as she goes from place to place. I mean, 
she kind of holds on to this idea, well, this happened at this place, and it doesn't hardly seem real anymore, and what does it really matter anyway, because people are dying of cholera. So she really tries to downplay what she has done. And that in itself is preventing her from finding this peace that she sees um, in the sisters. And this is further compounded by the fact that she's quite sure the Mother Superior knows what she did, um, but still includes her. In fact, at, at one point she becomes so frustrated with herself, Kitty does, she decides to come work for the Mother Superior and tend to the orphans in the convent. And again, though, she still cannot find, even in that kind of selfless work, acts, if you will, acts of kindness, she cannot find that peace and becomes even more disturbed, I would say, at what has happened. And again, it ties back into this phrase, regrettable and shocking, not something to be, quote, repented of. And without repentance, you cannot find salvation. That's a theme of the Painted Veil, which is so painfully demonstrated in what happens to Kitty. So I'm going to have to go into spoiler territory now, major spoilers, the whole ending of the book. So if you would like to stop the video here and go read the book, it only took me like maybe three, four hours to read the book total. Um, I highly recommend it. And maybe you can come back and watch the rest of the video after you've read it. But I'm going to keep going here. But spoiler alert. Because I hate spoilers. I like to read the whole book myself. But maybe you've already read the book or maybe you don't care so much about spoilers. Um, but I'm going to let you have a chance to stop the video and... Um, go read the book if you wish. Alright, we are back with the Painted Veil spoiler territory. So, throughout the book, I was really reading it as an allegory. And at first I was thinking, no, it's just me. I am trying to read my own opinions into this, etc. But there are so many things in the book that I feel really point to this idea of an allegory. I just think that... Well, I wanted to talk about that, and, you know, if you've read the book, let me know your thoughts on that interpretation. Um, there is this underlying theme of Kitty needing redemption, but not just redemption, reconciliation. And reconciliation with who? So, um, let's go back to her family for a minute. So, I mentioned in the last section, she's got a domineering mother and a weak father, and... The family, the mother, the two daughters, view him as just a breadwinner. They don't try to develop a meaningful relationship with him. And, you know, they just don't care about him at all. And it's this weak relationship Kitty has with this weak father that sets her up for this incredibly negative relationship with um, the charismatic uh, man of Hong Kong, Charlie Townsend. And... This lack of a dynamic here, this broken relationship, um, becomes a really twisted relationship with Charlie. He becomes a surrogate father of sorts. And, you know, she talks about this almost spiritual uh, relationship she has with him. And whenever she's feeling lonely and empty, she wants to be with this guy who clearly throughout the book is shown to be an abuser and a womanizer and really could care less about her in the long run. Um, contrasted with the younger man, Walter, and Walter is the one who loves Kitty at first certainly unconditionally, and I would say throughout the book unconditionally. He doesn't abandon her, he doesn't um, you know, he, he treats her 
as well as can be expected. And there is one detail in the book that's really interesting. And um, again, we're in spoilers now. Um, but she asks him, you know, why did you bring me here to this town that's stricken with cholera knowing I could die? And he said, yeah, I did that because I was so angry with you that I thought you might die. And, and she's kind of, she's kind of been suspecting this all along. And, and then she's suddenly like, it's, it's a bit shocking to her, but not completely shocking. Um, but that kind of explains to me the scene where he's eating the salad, which we talked about earlier. You know, he does feel this very real connection to Kitty. And in spite of the way she's abused his love and mistreated him in every way, he feels this sense, this honor-bound duty towards her. And not just duty, but actual love. So... What happens? Well, um, I was actually kind of surprised. I thought Kitty was going to die, but actually it's Walter who dies. And uh, he's out helping people as he is doing every day. And one day they come and get Kitty and tell her he's, he's going. And she shows up there and he's on his deathbed and just doesn't really even register that she's there and... Within a very short time, he's dead. So once again, Kitty is alone. And again, she's still in Hong Kong, or I should say she's still in the town where there's cholera. Um, Charlie and his wife are still in Hong Kong, and her mother's still back in England. Um, you would think that by now, having watched her husband die in a terrible way that Kitty would be would have a change of heart right like she would completely change her ways and and everything but this is where the novel is absolutely brilliant she doesn't change because she hasn't found the redemption or the reconciliation she hasn't repented and she hasn't been reconciled with the father right and just the death of Walter is not sufficient because she hasn't gone through that personal process. So what happens? She goes back to Hong Kong and she goes right back to this this guy. This guy who treats her like dirt, you know? And, you know, she's distraught, right? But, yeah, she goes back to the same guy. And there's one more thing that I almost forgot to mention, and which is actually pretty significant, so I'm sorry for neglecting to mention it, but Kitty is pregnant. She has a child, and Walter knew that, by the way, and she doesn't know whose child it is, and when she told Walter that, he was extremely distraught as you can imagine she wanted to lie to him and tell him it was his but she really didn't know so she just told him she didn't know and that was kind of the final nail in the coffin of their relationship you might say as far as any chance of love and happiness and then he didn't live to see the child born and and know whether you know there was any resemblance to one or the other um yeah so she goes back to this jerk you know she knows that she's prostituting herself right she knows that she's at the lowest of the low so and he's also a bit of a predator so it's not just you know it's not just her fault obviously but it's it's just a terrible situation this cycle of going back to this guy and this is where she does make a smart decision. She decides, you know, I can't be in the same city as this guy, obviously. she's She's got to go back to England. And it's at the same time or during this voyage, she finds out her mother has died. But it is it is significant that she makes this choice. This moment she decides to leave Hong Kong is... Is the, is the real turning point. The beginning of the repentance, right? So, 
she goes back to England, she finds out Mother is also dead. And there's this beautiful scene with her father, her real father, where Kitty sees what has happened, what the kind of damage her mother had caused in the family. She sees that, you know, her father, again, he's a weak guy, but he's not a bad guy either. He's stayed with the mother all this time, even though nobody loved this father. Kind of a little bit like Walter, you might say. You know, she realizes finally, getting away from him, getting away from the mother in that way, she realizes this brokenness here. And that's when she decides she's got to turn around. And there is a beautiful moment of reconciliation. It's kind of ironic because the father, at this point, when the mother dies, he's just learned that he's gotten a great position in the Bahamas as some kind of official. I don't remember exactly uh, what it was, but he's going to be leaving England. And, you know, he says, you don't need to come with me. And he doesn't really have any particular feelings for his children, as you can imagine. But she's like, no, we are still family. Uh, Doris has married somebody else by this time. And she wants to mend the relationship with her father. So she goes with him to the Bahamas with the child. You know, she has decided to try to make a new life for herself and break free of this ugly cycle. And I will actually read a couple of quotes from the book that kind of tie into this suggestion of, an, of a Christian allegory. One of them is by the Mother Superior, which I kind of alluded to in the previous part. And let me see what she says here. This is so good. She says, Remember that it is nothing to do your duty. That is demanded of you and is no more meritorious than to wash your hands when they are dirty. The only thing that counts is the love of duty. When love and duty are one, then grace is in you and you will enjoy happiness, which passes all understanding. And it's so interesting because that is exactly what Walter did, right? Now, he struggled a bit with the love part, right? Because he had been wronged so greatly. And, you know, there's only so much you can... Like, he might have been able to forgive better if he had had more time, more time to himself, perhaps. And if she had actually turned her behavior around earlier. Um, but at least he did his duty, right? And the mother, you know, is the mother superior, that is, is telling her... You shouldn't feel good for just doing the bare minimum, which, ironically, she wasn't even doing at the time. Um, but that is something that we kind of forget, especially now. We always seem to hear these messages that if you just do this, you know, this good deed, or if you just do, you know, the things that are should be just a given, that you're somehow moral and particularly righteous, but that's not really the point uh, of duty. Um, the other thing I wanted to read was the, actually the very ending, if I may. I'm just going to read some excerpts from the ending, and I'm not going to read everything, obviously. I just want to read a few of the quotes. She says, Oh, Father, I've been through so much. I've been so unhappy. I'm not the kitty I was when I went away. I'm terribly weak, but I don't think I'm the filthy cad I was then. Won't you give me a chance? I have nobody but you in the world now. Won't you let me try to make you love me? Oh, Father, I am so lonely and so miserable. I want your love so badly. I want a girl because I want to bring her up so that she shan't make the mistakes I made. When I look back upon the girl I was, I hate myself. But I never had a chance. I'm going to bring up my daughter so that she's free and can stand on her own feet. I want her to be a person, independent of others, because she is possessed of herself. And I want her to take life like a free man and make a better job of it than I have. So there's this part in the first part of the book that I forgot to allude to. And she's talking to Mr. Waddington about the Tao. And he's trying to describe it to her and... 
the way he describes it is kind of ambiguous, right? There is this ambiguous element to it that can't be quite pinpointed. And so that's very much contrasted throughout the book with the the confidence of the Catholic nuns. And so the very ending of the book goes like this. The sun rose, dispelling the mist, and she saw winding onwards as far as the eye could reach, among the rice fields, across a little river and through undulating country, the path they were to follow. Perhaps her faults and follies, the unhappiness she had suffered, were not entirely vain if she could follow the path that now she dimly discerned before her. Not the path that kind, funny old Waddington had spoken of that led no whither, but the path those dear nuns at the convent followed so humbly, the path that led to peace. So I think that this reading of it, though it may seem a bit, um, it may seem like adding another layer of interpretation. I think there is something to that that he was trying to get at here. And while Walter is not by any means the perfect type, if you will, of Jesus, and while the Father is by no means a type of God the Father. Still, this kind of, uh, this pattern that you see is really a pretty strong allegory. And Kitty, of course, falling so low and suffering so much um, before that turning point is also, I think, a very good allegory. So, anyway, um, I really loved this book. I think it makes a wonderful companion to books like This Side of Paradise, The Great Gatsby, and The House of Mirth. Except I feel like this novel puts everything into a really beautiful perspective, and I still appreciate those other novels as well. It's just that this one, again, it just puts certain elements into what I feel like are a more uh, proper setting. So, thank you so much for watching, and... I hope to see you in my next video. Uh, let me know if you have any thoughts on this novel, any suggestions for future videos. Um, please like the video if you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time.